Hi, this is Eric Foote. I'm a Managing Director at Deloitte Consulting, and I'm here to talk to you today about increasing your operational efficiency and business agility with Epic on AWS. During this session, we'll cover a, a number of items. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Deloitte, what we see as the industry challenge in healthcare, um, respectful to all enterprise applications, and then narrowing it into the Epic space. Um, we'll go over our Epic on AWS solution, talk about what a migration journey would look like for a client, and then talk through how the benefits on AWS play back to the client as well, and then give you some information on how you can get started on your journey to Epic on AWS. So some of the delight differentiators, you know, we're a global consulting company and uh, offer multi-industry services across uh, not only healthcare, but most of the other major industries as well. Um, we have you know, some of the highest recognition in all of those industries. Healthcare is one of our key uh, performing market competencies. And um, we've of course developed a number of trusted relationships um, with our clients. And as part of AWS, we're actually a, a global partner, premier partner. And we have uh, thousands of, of practitioners that actually serve the AWS community and, and ultimately help us with our Epic on AWS um, offering. So talking a little bit about what we see in the healthcare industry uh, from a challenges perspective, um, looking at enterprise applications in healthcare, um, we, we started to query a number of our clients and found that there was some common themes across not only EHRs such as Epic, uh, but also major applications such as EMRs, uh, ERPs, and, and, and other critical technologies. Um, if you think about how we're architecting these critical systems, um, you know, one of the common themes is that we buy not only what we need for production, but also what we need for disaster recovery. And typically those, those architectures are sized in such a way that we're roughly 50% higher than what we expect peak demand to be. Um, with that, if you think about buying 150% for your production environment and 150% for your disaster recovery environment, you're effectively spending three times as much as you would need uh, on compute capacity alone. If you pivot that to storage, uh, given the criticality of the data, uh, most are keeping multiple copies of that, whether it's for disaster recovery, reporting, support activities, things like that. Um, we're seeing up to 12 copies of, of ma major uh, production data sets uh, within an enterprise. So if you think about scaling the data set itself by a terabyte, you're roughly buying another 12 terabytes in order to keep up with the demand uh, for that, that platform. Um, Citrix, popular delivery mechanism uh, in the healthcare space, um, you know, again, um, size similarly as the compute infrastructure, uh, but also refresh much more quickly, um, typically as new processors are released, Citrix and the application delivery platforms actually uh, benefit most from some of the new advancements in processors. So we typically see the 3x uh, uh, sizing there, and then also a, a shorter refresh cycle, usually in the three-year range, um, so those uh, capital expenditures come along much more quickly. Um, we're also seeing a, a faster release cycle uh, in healthcare. You know, what we used to do every couple of years as a major project is now being done multiple times a year, in some cases even four times a year. Um, so being able to automate and, and make the infrastructure more agile to support those release cycles is becoming more important. Um, finally, you know, geo-redundant geo, uh, disaster recovery, um, more and more organizations through mergers and acquisitions are, are becoming um, um, reliant on having um, disaster recovery split across multiple geographies and having to acquire, maintain, and operate data centers outside of the general headquarter realm is, is typically a problematic area. So we've seen these as, as common trends. Um, we've, we've mapped them you know, into the EHR space and looked at it you know, very closely with Epic. And we believe that most of these, these challenges apply to Epic as well. Our Epic on AWS solution uh, is a combination, of course, of Epic um, on, running on top of AWS capacity we have a cloud engineering group, which is part of my group that actually runs um, um, all of the AWS capacity architecture and implementation. And then we have a digital care group 
uh, that actually manages the Epic application. Uh, if you think about some of the, the technical com components like um, uh, Cache and uh, Clarity and Cajito, um, those components are all managed by our digital care group. So we combine all three of those um, to, to really build a solution that offers the client um, you know, an elastic and scalable, rapidly deployable uh, Epic on, on AWS platform. <clears throat> Thinking about the migration journey, um, you know, given that this is a relatively new entry into the market, um, we see most looking at, you know, what can it do for me? We've talked about some of the problem statements that we're trying to solve. Um, typically, one of the major reasons why folks look at moving their EHR uh, the cloud, Epic to AWS in this case, is really looking at what the art of the possible is around cost savings. Um, so if you think about some of the challenges that I spoke about in, in, in the prior slide, um, you know, not having to purchase that, that 2X disaster recovery capacity and a, another X of excess capacity just to stay ahead of the curve for peak demand, using the cloud to be able to um, basically buy what you need and only pay for what you need when you need it is an important piece of how we, you know, actually save money with this solution. So most people are starting with a business case where we take a look at what the current spend is on the infrastructure for Epic and then compare that to what it would look like if we were to move one or more um, environments into AWS um, to operate it. Um, so we've, we've done a number of those uh, over the last 12 months, probably over 15 of them. And we're seeing pretty consistent savings there that we'll talk about in the slides to come. Uh, but that's where most people are starting. From there, they typically move into a proof of concept. Uh, some are electing to go down a, a, a non-PHI environment, such as um, like training. Others are pivoting directly to, that, to disaster recovery as a proof of concept, given that gives them a full scale view of how it actually works. And typically in the business case uh, phase, we see the most savings uh, in the disaster recovery migration to AWS. We believe once people you know, move through that process and get to a point where disaster recovery is running on AWS, then after a few test cycles, which typically happen annually, um, they become more comfortable to consider pivoting all of production uh, into AWS and, and likely coinciding with their next major hardware refresh. So for most, this, this could be you know, a one to two year journey uh, depending on when that hardware refresh cycle comes up. Um, thinking about some of the benefits here, you know, if we map back to the challenges, reducing operating costs um, re really is, is the key play here. We're seeing many organizations come out of COVID-19 with extra pressure to really drive down costs and, and flatten out those capital expenditures. Um, using the elasticity of AWS, we can absolutely flatten, if not fully remove, the CapEx spend uh, related to Epic infrastructure and also um, help smooth the OpEx spend based on actual demand. So rather than buying your storage, you know, three years at a time, you can buy it one quarter at a time or one year at a time and just stay ahead of the curve and pay for only what you need while you need it. Um, right sizing the environments. If you look at disaster recovery, we typically see roughly seven to eight percent of production capacity spend is actually what is needed just to support replicate only disaster recovery. So not having to pay for that other 92 or 93 percent of capacity when you're in that replicate only mode, which is the bulk of the time, um, is really a major cost savings driver. Um, and then we're also seeing some improvements in deployment. If you think about you know having to refresh a hardware platform or implement uh, new hardware uh, for for an acquisition, for instance, you know those those procurement cycles, configuration, build, test, and ready for production are typically measured in four to six month uh, timelines. We've you know built all of the reference architecture for Epic on AWS as infrastructure as code, and we can literally deploy the platform to support the base Epic infrastructure in about eleven minutes. Um, for the proof of concepts that we've been doing. Um, you know, we've went from zero, meaning a client hasn't had any AWS workload whatsoever to done, meaning we have an environment running that we can test against in about 11 days. So, you know, that's that's something that's just not achievable in a legacy data center. And then, you know, mapping that to the cost side in those same 11 days that we stood up an environment, we spent less, less than $400 on AWS capacity to actually get it to work. Um, if you look on the right side of the screen, 
Um, we've we've done a number of these business cases and we're starting to see a, some trends. Um, in this particular example, we had a client that was spending about $107 million uh, over a seven year period on, on Epic infrastructure, um, looking at production, disaster recovery, and non-production, you know, they all netted savings north of 40% with disaster recovery being a 62% savings um, when, when compared to on-premise. So thinking about how you get started, um, as we talked about in the journey, most are starting with a business case. We've had uh, a number of, of recent ones that have launched that have not only went for the business case, but also proof of concept in parallel. Um, so really starting to jump in, look at the financial side of it, and also start to get their hands around what is it going to take to actually pull this off. Um, so a business case with proof, proof of concept is an excellent starting point. Um, generally, we'll see uh, an investment from AWS and Deloitte, as well as the client. Uh, so it's basically a three-way split. Um, we're, we're looking at you know, ways to minimize the cost impact to the clients as we're trying to save the money. Uh, but but realize that it, it is quite a bit of work. Typically, a, a business case and proof of concept runs in the six to 10 week range, uh, but we do have uh, financial investments that we can help uh, with that. Um, others are pivoting, as I mentioned, right to the disaster recovery pilot. Um, that is typically where we see the best benefit in the business case scenario, 62% um, in the example that I gave you before. Um, so we, we've got you know a program where we can do that. Um, Largely, the timeline is based on, on how much data we have to move. Uh, these typically run in the eight to 12 uh, week implementation cycles. And again, it's a three-way split uh, between Deloitte investment, AWS investment, and the client. And then finally, you know, moving into a full Epic implementation, this one's probably more applicable for a, a new implementation. So we you know, have helped many clients that are, are new to Epic look at what their hosting options are and help them decide which path to go down. Uh, the business case would certainly support that. Uh, and then, you know, if they chose to put just disaster recovery or the full stack on, on AWS, it's, it's something that Deloitte can actually help with. So thank you uh, for your time. Uh, we, we have a full team of people that support this. I appreciate your attention in this and hopefully uh, we can connect and, and talk more specifically about your, your current situation. So thank you.